Uh, welcome uh, to the Save Community Council Committee meeting for April 26, 2023. We're in the Everett City Council Chambers and guests are welcome to join us. Uh, we, we don't take public comment during our committee meetings. Um, and I want to welcome, um, I'm Vice President Judy Tui, as well as Council Member Ben Zarlingo. We have uh, City uh, Employee Jennifer Gregerson and Ryan Sass from Public Works, who has a team with him, and I'll let him introduce his team now. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to introduce some of our senior staff. I, <clears throat> I think most of you worked with Corey Hurt, our city traffic engineer. And we also have uh, Tom Hood, city engineer and assistant public works director, and Grant Moen, maintenance superintendent and assistant public works director. Thank you. So with that, on our agenda this, uh, this evening will be, uh, the first item is traffic calming, and I believe Corey's doing that. Corey? Great, thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to the Safe Community Council Committee about traffic calming this evening. I thought I'd start with a brief example of the speed issues we face in Everett in our neighborhoods every day. So this is uh, Fulton and 17th Street looking south across 17th Street. Is the roadway is a crown with a 5% grade. Uh, back in 2020, there was a bump sign with a 15 mile per hour advisory and several gouges in the pavement where vehicles appear to have bottomed out on either side of the intersection. Here's a couple short clips from one of our safety conscious residents that was taken on the, from their front porch. Uh, they sent several clips and I'll show just a couple. The first two clips are time stamped about 30 seconds apart. And then uh, roughly uh, 30 seconds later, somebody turned around and made the return trip. So after speaking with our streets division about reducing the crown of the roadway, I found out it'd take significant drainage work on grinding and paving, and we made the decision to reverse the stop signs in 2021. Uh, traffic now stops on Fulton and is largely unrestricted on 17th. This is not an action traffic engineers take uh, lightly because drivers grow accustomed to stop conditions. And the activity uh, was greatly curtailed, and in my knowledge, there have been no serious crashes at the intersection after the change, but what this shows is not every action we take is 100% effective. So in that case, they ran the stop sign and sped through the intersection. So when the metric is speed, traffic calming has little effect on average and operating speed. Most reasonable drivers drive reasonably. Traffic calming is intended to re remove outliers, unreasonable drivers who exceed the posted speed limit excessively. Traffic calming tries to harmonize speeds, reducing the number of higher speed drivers and improving safety for pedestrians, cyclists, and all forms of active transportation. These are our most vulnerable users. Perceived safety is often cited as a reason why people do not choose active transportation modes. Vehicle speed plays a role. There are many forms of neighborhood traffic calming in Everett from raised crosswalks at uh, locations like Riverfront Boulevard, traffic diverters like at Pacific and Norton. Also raised medians on Rucker and downtown and on the new Fleming bicycle corridor. Traffic circles at Oaks and Lombard on 33rd Street, just to name a few. Some of the elements are more effective than others. Some are very expensive, but really it's about selecting the best countermeasure for a given situation. There are also some everyday low cost elements that exist and we make revisions all the time. Appropriate speed limits, on street parking, stop signs, enhanced crosswalks uh, with uh, flashing beacons, just to name a few. Every capital project, whether it be on an arterial or a local street, includes traffic calming elements with an eye towards moderating speed so that every mode is equitably accommodated. On Monday, the state traffic engineer and the former city of Everett traffic engineer posted on his rather prolific Twitter account several images of positive traffic calming elements in Everett. 
Below are images posted of Rucker Avenue before and after. It's always positive to get your efforts recognized, but there's still work to do. Our process in public works to address uh, neighborhood speed concerns and other safety issues comes from many sources. Emails, public works dispatch, the transportation advisory committee, social media, phone calls, um, petitions, and, and often staff observations. Our process is uniform, requests are logged and assigned, and the issue at hand is studied. It could include uh, laying pneumatic tubes to study the area for speeds and classification, cameras, observations and measurements, crash history and other existing data. A determination is made by staff and improvements are implemented as funding allows. Some facts about crashing in Ever crashes in Everett. Local streets have roughly triple the center line miles of arterials and collectors in Everett. When actual lane miles are considered, local streets are still roughly double of arterials and collectors. Last summer, I had our interns evaluate five years of crash data uh, citywide. I asked them to look at arterial crashes and crashes within half block of an arterial. When it came to any uh, injury crashes, 92% occurred on arterials and collectors. Fatal crashes occurred 93% uh, of the time on um, arterials and collectors. Pedestrian, pedestrian injuries were 87% on arterials and collectors and bicycle injuries, 82% occurred on our arterials. So by comparison, uh, serious crashes on our local streets uh, occur less often. But clearly safety work going forward includes both neighborhood traffic calming and transportation safety citywide. Enter Safe Streets for All, a federal discretionary program under the bipartisan infrastructure law with $5 billion in appropriated funds over the next five years. The SS4A program funds regional, local, and tribal initiatives through grants to prevent roadway deaths and serious injuries. In conjunction with several other cities, Everett has applied and was selected for a planning grant with the Puget Sound Regional Council as lead agency. The Everett Grant includes over $700,000 in funds for Everett to develop a comprehensive safety action plan, often referred to as Vision Zero in some other communities in Washington. It will provide a top to bottom review of transportation safety in Everett with the ultimate goal of zero fatalities or serious injuries. It's the only worthy goal of any good safety plan. As part of Vision Zero and Everett, all aspects of transportation will be reviewed and set forth a plan to reach zero. Arterial and neighborhood speed limits, bicycle and pedestrian safety, neighborhood traffic calming, crosswalk policy, stop and stop sign policy will all be under review and recommendations will be made in the plan. Targets and goals will be measured and reported on. It will guide our future effort for the next 20 years and beyond, and it will also qualify the city for future implementation grant funding. Uh, an a, uh, a target zero, vision zero type uh, study or plan is required for future funding for construction projects. I'm excited about the development of a vision zero plan for Everett and, sh and uh, the shift towards more safety funding at the state and federal level. And I look forward to working with this, commi this committee and our community on a safety action plan. And that's all I have. So I just want to, so we have received 700,000 for this plan. Correct. That's great. And so um, when do we think, when will that, when's the start and projected end date for that results for the plan? So right now we are in process of negotiating an agreement with uh, PSRC who is doing a lot of the paperwork with okay. Um, with the USDOT and so when we have the agreement in place we anticipate having a draft plan in about a year okay that's great congratulations that sounds like that will really help us a lot to kind of pull that together yeah <clears throat> yeah especially right now where we're having a hard time uh, maintaining adequate staffing in the traffic division this is a way we can get a lot of work done so so it'll be outside folks that will do the study. Yeah, they'll, we'll That's hire great. a consultant to help with the bulk of the work. That's great. Yeah. I like that. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I've been. Turn the mic on. 
I, as part of my um, service on the elected leadership group for Sound Transit, we've been looking at uh, transit stops and stuff for the future. But that brings into question um, some of those some of those planned stops or optional stops are on um, Evergreen Way, Highway 99, one of them's at Airport Road, um, and uh, Evergreen Way, the other one's at Casino Road intersection there. And one of the thorny problems there is those are big high-speed roads, wide roads, and there have been injuries and fatalities there. And I guess, first, I'm happy to see this because it would be nice to know as much as possible as progress goes ahead on developing those stops so that we can minimize the difficulty of that, although it, uh, so I'm, I assume that'll be one of the significant focuses of it is that those especially high speed and especially high capacity areas. Yes, absolutely. We'll be looking at transit corridors separately. We'll be looking at high pedestrian corridors and we'll also be looking at uh, high collision corridors like Evergreen Way and Broadway. And then I think probably feeding into that, and I imagine you already are, but a, a focus on those spots so that we can be ready as we look. Because there'll be EIS is done on those areas. That's kind of the next stage there. So it might be nice to, to watch as that goes and, and have as much knowledge as we can there to coordinate those because there'll be lots of people crossing. But I, that sounds like a particularly difficult one to try to keep the injuries and facilities down. So absolutely happy to hear that. Thank you. Uh, I, so I have a question. This came up about um, asphalt art as far as crosswalks and, you know, in intersections. Um, and I just didn't know what, what you guys have read about it or what your, is that part of the potential plan? I know Seattle's done a lot of work with that. I hadn't uh, anticipated being part of a target zero plan, but mm -hmm. we can certainly ask our uh, our consultant to look at any traffic calming effects that uh, that asphalt type art might have. Yeah, and you know, and also for in the neighborhoods, if there's just some things that you know, if people feel that they're driving too fast for the kids that are out there playing and that kind of thing. If um, I know the one <clears throat> program I was looking at was Edmonds was doing something with the neighborhood associations where if they have an issue with the traffic, then they submit to try to get some what and I think most of the time they just bring in the digital um, speedometer that tells people how fast they're going to kind of get them to realize that they're going too fast for that residential area so it wouldn't you know I'm, I'm hoping that we can also kind of look at that or do we just have the citizens then just email in to to you guys and say hey this is you know constantly been too much for us is that how you want them to address that? That certainly, you know, matches our current practice in terms mm -hmm. of having the public contact us and then we initiate a study and we go back and see if it has justifies uh, enforcement uh, mm -hmm. emphasis. And so, uh, but one of the aspects of this work that we can do through SS4A is to also look at other programs. So we can look at some, some examples that are bookends, whereas uh, Edmonds is sort of a small scale neighborhood focus program and Kirkland it has a more comprehensive uh, more technology based uh, traffic calming program and so we'll be able to look at those as examples and oh, then try to figure out what's going to work best for everyone. Great, great. Do you have any other questions Ben? No, I'm really happy to hear about these focuses um, and that you've got a, a regularized program so that you can fairly and consistently implement the kind of feedback we get from the neighborhoods because that is one of the things that crops up often in neighborhoods. I guess the only other thing that comes up is, oh, why don't you do speed bumps or speed humps? <laughs> and I just saw something the other day. There was a city that was trying speed cushions, which I think I saw on one of your slides. The idea there, I think, was that uh, emergency vehicles, most of them, could straddle those things. They were a narrower thing, but cars typically could not. Um, I'm not sure if we, in any directly publicly accessible thing, kind of explain why we don't typically do those, but that might be something to, maybe Jennifer, we can send out a, you know, we can have something that's something we can give to the neighborhood groups so we have a. That's, that's a good point. Because yeah. good, good the question does come up with the frequency, and if there's anything you wanted to say about it, feel free, but otherwise I don't want to put you on the spot yeah, about I, that. I believe we've got a, an FAQ available on the website as to why why that particular tool isn't uh, of speed humps isn't a tool that we use anymore and and there's 
I mean, there's a whole slew of reasons, um, but a couple that come to mind other than just emergency vehicles are the, the noise and that, uh, and so people slow down, you hear the squeak of brakes, the thump thump of the thing, and then an acceleration as people try to make up the time that they mm -hmm. felt that they somehow lost. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had kind of a unique opportunity in a, a part where we had inherited some that had been built by the county and that we removed. And so we were able to do a speed study before and after, and it, it bore out our particular perspective is that it didn't lower speeds overall and that our speeds were actually lower in that particular instance after we removed them. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Great. Thanks. Well, thank you. Um, appreciate that. And I know that we're doing a lot with our bicycle plan and this will all kind of dovetail together. So that's just great. Glad, congratulations on the grant. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, we'll move on to our second item now, which is the Public Works Employee Safety Ordinance. And so I think Hill might be here to help us with that. Yeah. <clears throat> or Grant, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, well, <laughs> my name's Grant, Grant uh, Moen. Yeah, Hill and I are both here to, to talk through this. Um, this uh, the obstruction of a public works worker, the proposed ordinance was first briefed on March 29th of this year. And uh, after uh, some council input, there was a request for us to talk at this safety meeting about how uh, the ordinance could also potentially relate to other situations that other city staff could find themselves in as well. And so I'm going to speak to some of the points that makes, uh, you know, some of the points relating to public works that is somewhat unique to public works. And then Hill is going to speak to how uh, some of the other departments and other city staff members, uh, you know, how they would be you know, potentially fall within this or have other means to have protection um, through, uh, you know, through other means that we have available for, for staff and city residents. Public Works uh, primary mission, uh, one of the primary missions is definitely public safety, uh, whether that be traffic as Corey was just speaking to or uh, cleaning debris or obstructions from right of ways, whether that be uh, water, uh, sewer, utilities, um, definitely you know, ADA, et cetera, the public safety is a, is a key component to, to much of what Public Works does. And much of what our work is, is out in right of ways. It's out in uh, easements. It's um, you know, really throughout the city where we have, we have public works workers going, uh, you know, whether that be it within the street, within the street corridor, where it's clearly, uh, you know, there's a city presence or even in right of ways, maybe behind the sidewalk where it could appear to be someone's yard or other, other property that's not as improved, but maybe there's a buried water line or sewer line or something of that nature there. Or, or even in easements that are you know, behind someone's, you know, running through someone's property, maybe in their backyard, that someone might not be as familiar with uh, the fact that Public Works has you know, critical infrastructure running through those locations. And so our, our work takes us all, all throughout the city. Um, Public Works work takes all throughout the city. And that, uh, that does lead to interactions with uh, you know, residents, um, with, with people that may or may not understand why um, Public Works is at that location. And, in addition to that, uh, oftentimes uh, that, that work can be urgent, time, you know, time sensitive. It can be a, a situation where maybe there's a water main break or a sewer main break. Um, there's, there's some, you know, a hazard that's in the, in the right of way that could be a hazard to pedestrians walking, could be a hazard to cars. Uh, there, there's, a, there's an urgency to what uh, is needed from public works in our, in our response and in our work. And this ordinance was really drafted with that in mind that the public works has the need to, you know, get to these locations that may be, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more, uh, you know, out, outside of an area where the the general resident would would understand um, that the public works need to be there. It would maybe bring us into contact with um, different uh, individuals of the public uh, in situations where there could be potential confrontations, and and public works has a need to do those, um, you know, do those actions in in some cases very quickly. Uh, because of uh, the, the potential damage to property, potential impacts to public safety. And so this ordinance really would provide a mechanism where in those situations, uh, we would, you know, public works would be able to be supported by potentially uh, the police department to make sure that we can get to the places, uh, our city staff can get to the places they need to be to do their work in a safe manner and, and expeditiously taking care of those, uh, you know, those concerns. And I mean, I'll turn it over to Hill now to speak to some of the distinctions with other other departments and other city staff and how uh, 
how their work might uh, take them into contact with the public in other ways. Sure, and our code already includes provision for other employees that similarly work out in the field, such as watershed patrol officers, law enforcement officers, animal control officers, park rangers, and uh, deputy sealers and sealers, although I don't know where they do their work. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, of course, all city employees, like all um, people who live and spend time in the city are protected by the general criminal laws. And so if an employee is subject to an assault or harassment, um, that would be covered by our general criminal law provisions. Um, and most of the employees are going to be working in locations subject to a code of conduct. Um, if you work in any of our city buildings and someone were to come in and begin obstructing or harassing or some behavior that didn't quite rise to the level of a general criminal conduct, they could be um, asked to leave, they could be trespassed, they could um, be told not to return to that location subject to uh, future arrest. And those all um, currently exist. And uh, I know one of the main questions that came up was why, don't, why doesn't this law apply broadly? And I, I think it really is um, situated to the unique work that the public works employees experience being out in the field dealing with situations that are um, urgent and emergent and uh, often in a time when somebody is experiencing some stress having to do with permits or a broken water main or having power shut off. And um, because they're not within city property or city buildings, they um, don't have the ability to say, you know, you're trespassed from here, you can't come back here, you're violating the code of, of conduct. And so that's why this ordinance um, is necessary to provide them with the level of protection that other employees might get due to their being situated in uh, city facilities. So I have a question about um, like our park rangers who may who usually are in the park, but they also drive through town from park to park and that kind of thing. Would this would they also be covered under those who work out in the field? Well, they are covered under uh, their separate ordinance for obstructing a park ranger, okay. which is also enforced through criminal enforcement provision. Um, you know, they would, it would have to be during the time when they're acting as a park ranger. Um, so if they were in another part of the city, you know, or not currently, you know, enforcing the park code, then it wouldn't apply. But it covers them when they're uh, engaged in their work as park rangers. Okay, thank you. So um, this, did you have any questions, Ben? One. Okay, go ahead. Um, a, a similar group. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, a similar group uh, are the workers, and I guess they're often contract workers, who go out and mark utilities either for construction or I imagine you might need to do the same thing if you found you had an urgent problem and you needed to know where the fiber or the cables or other things were. Are they involved in this? Uh, are they under an umbrella if they're acting on behalf of the city or a other contractor? Yeah, so I think you're speaking to the utility locate and yes. dig laws. Yes, there and, you go. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And that for for projects, like you say, there can be locates that are design locates, and there can also be emergency locates when, uh, you know, if there's a, a water main that breaks, for instance, then you call in an emergency locate because you're going out there to, to fix that water right. main, but you also are going to need to dig down and you need to know what else is there, if there's a gas line, if there's a sewer line, things of mm -hmm. that nature. And so we call that those emergency uh, locates. City, city staff, actually, public works staff has a, a couple folks that do those locates. There's some folks in traffic that do locates, and there's some folks in the water and sewer group that do uh, locates as well that will locate our water lines, sewer lines, um, and some of our power and other conduits that we have uh, you know, throughout the city. And so this ordinance, the, the proposed ordinance would cover those public works uh, staff that are doing that, and they do, like you say, get calls potentially in the middle of the night to go out and do a locate. Uh, because of somebody else's project, you know, some you know could be mm -hmm. a power project, could be anything, anybody, any time that there's a requirement to dig, there's a requirement to do the uh, the dial a dig. Um, other other agencies such as PUD or PSE um, that would be coming out to do locates in that type of a scenario would, I guess, I'll let Hill speak to how they might be covered. Yeah, this ordinance proposed ordinance um, covers people who are subcontracted 
by public work, so they would get the same protections, protections as okay. an employee. It would not cover, for example, someone who works for the PUD who came out to read the meter or mm -hmm. um, address some of their infrastructure because there would not be city employees, although I do believe there are some state laws that protect people who read meters. Read meters yeah. um, Sounds like the focus is really more on more urgent situations. I mean, I suppose if you had a recalcitrant, recalcitrant, recalcitrant cat property owner, um, but it wasn't urgent, you might just back off and give them a number to call and then have a separate thing. But what you, what you most need are, uh, are the clear protections for an urgent situation. Yeah. I think we, we said this in the original briefing, but this is not an end route around the normal process that a property owner might have. You know, for example, if the water was being shut off, they may have remedies, you know, civil mm -hmm. or otherwise to address that. Um, this is not in an effort to, you know, they would have all of those. This is really for those emergent situations. Okay. Yeah, that, that's really what I hope to emphasize. And, and the purpose for this is that in some situations when a city worker is out working and somebody is in their face in a bad attitude, you can just say, hey, great, I'm out of here. We'll come back later. But if we're doing a water transmission line repair where the health and safety of large swaths of population are uh, relying on us getting that done and getting it done right then. We don't really have the opportunity to say, oh, sorry, it's bothering you. We'll come back later. Okay, so the staff is recommending um, the ordinance as it was presented to council. Is that, Am I correct on that? Um, and so maybe what we can do is just in the briefing, you know, discuss some of the issues that we talked about here that had come up. Um, and so when will, when uh, do you guys, do we know when that will come up to council? We'll just get it back in the agenda process. We, we've had it for next week, uh -huh. if it's okay with you guys for, for May 3rd for action. But again, we could, I can add a little bit to the, the cover sheet or have a short briefing if you think that. Well, probably good. we should since it was pulled yep. off the agenda um, and there's Sounds just good. two of us here. Yeah. So I think and we definitely should have a briefing yes. on it and okay. the other anticipated the other anticipated ordinances for that night may mean a lengthy agenda so if we're going to have time to discuss then maybe maybe yeah. one week back actually that also has a budget briefing on the agenda so oh. that's the actually the long one officially the other ones aren't <laughs> so, so maybe the week after the third the tenth yeah, you know, if that, yeah yeah if that's good that you we might all feel better about it on, mm -hmm. on may 10th and yeah okay and then we'll, and we can do a briefing, or we, the global we. <laughs> I'll trust your judgment on that. Okay, so um, anything else, Ben? No. Okay. So uh, we'll move on to our next item, which is uh, the photo enforcement implementation. And I think that might be That is Corey me. Corey, again. Great. Thank you. Corey Hertz, city traffic engineer again. Um, yeah, the current photo enforcement program began its journey in the Council Public Safety Committee back in 2019, so I just wanted to report back with a brief update on our current progress. Staff's been working diligently on getting a safety-driven uh, photo enforcement program um, out on the street. Uh, right now we're working uh, in Public Works on a comprehensive communication plan that will focus on locals, neighborhoods, and Horizon Elementary. Uh, the, a recent evaluation in Linwood um, showed that their you know, robust photo enforcement program indicated that 86% of the citations were issued to vehicles registered outside the city. Uh, with the number of trips that we have of commuters and things like that, I think Everett can expect numbers in that, level, in that area as well. Uh, the focus of our communication plan will be to reach every resident we can and let them know where photo enforcement is, it'll be occurring, and when it, when it starts taking effect. Uh, we'll also be outreaching to large employers and can advise their so they can advise their employees that Everett is now a photo enforcement city and they can look for the signs. The communication plan will seek to reach people who normally might not get notified, like residents in multifamily housing and human resource providers. Uh, as far as the construction and permitting side, uh, Novoa Global has been out conducting some prior condition studies that we can compare 
and draw some conclusions from with other uh, other cities that are also doing photo enforcement. Um, right now, they looked at the number of red light violations for a few days, and they spent a week in the Horizon School Zone uh, while the beacons were flashing uh, recording speeds. Uh, we'll use this information to validate the number of cita citations we expect and an appropriate speed buffer for the school speed zone. I'm awaiting the results. We should have uh, uh, we should have some, or we do have some uh, appropriate reduction factors that will apply when the system is turned on, and further reductions for a mature system to evaluate how many citations we anticipate. Navo Global's in process of performing system layout and a design, and agreements and permits are are the next step. So for police, myself and our traffic sergeant visited the city of Tukwila to learn how they have implemented their photo enforcement program and will be visiting Tacoma soon. Both of these are Navoa Global customers. We've seen the software in real world implementation and look forward to what we can learn in Tacoma. For courts and information technology, we expect photo enforcement will add roughly 30,000 citations to the system when mature, for a mature system. Uh, which is double the, at least the number of citations that need to be processed by the municipal court. IT and the municipal court are working on uh, software efficiencies that include uh, software packages called O-Court, Catalys, or what used to be called N-Court, and LaserFish. These software systems will allow a streamlined court scheduling process, uh, standard forms that will integrate with state judicial information systems, and uh, an electronic payment system that includes credit cards and uh, as well as electronic wallets like Venmo. These improvements are essential to rolling out photo enforcement and are really the critical path item on the schedule. Municipal court staff and IT are, went down to Tukwila today to learn uh, how, how they can best implement O-Court. Um, these systems will pay dividends for the court system for more than just photo, photo enforcement in the future by improving efficiency. Um, at this point, we were, um, we are still hoping to have the system uh, in the Horizon School Zone uh, up and running by the time school starts. But with any software package and major change like that, um, it is possible that uh, implementation could delay it. We do have IT and uh, municipal court are working hard to get those systems um, up and running. That's great that you're getting all that on the back end, whoops, on the back side, getting that up to date. So look forward to that. And I know we'll, sometimes when they first get the cameras going, do they have a period of time where they just send out um, when someone goes through the red light instead of finding them, you just get a letter of say, hey, this is happening. And there'll be a time frame where we just send a warning letter. Yep, absolutely. At first, the system will be tested, so they'll see the flash mm -hmm. before any warnings are issued. Uh, once the system's tested and verified and ready to go, uh, we'll issue warnings only for 30 days. Okay. And then following that period, citations will start to be issued. Okay, so we're looking at that maybe sometime next fall? Um, I'm, I'm or... hoping by, by the end of this year at the latest. Okay. So. Okay. Ben, do you have any questions? Uh, just clarification. So the first implementation will be for the school zones, as opposed to the um, uh, as opposed to the intersections, and that will be Horizon Elementary, and that's the one that I think is about 500 West Casino Road or so. Correct. Okay, okay. and that was also the most troublesome school zone we had. That's right. That's the that's the school zone we've seen the highest speeds, and also the one that has traditionally been the. Uh, the highest enforcement resources have been put to, so that'll free up those officers for other work. Ah, okay, because that, that, I know that was a subject of a lot of the discussion earlier, was the, the purpose of this is improving safety, and, uh, and any uh, revenues that go beyond what's necessary to do it will contribute to street safety, and, um, and, and then you've got, sounds like you've got a system in place to evaluate those earlier conditions, and then after the implementation of the cameras to understand the actual effects. That's correct. Thank you. Well, I don't have, there's, they don't put, didn't have anything else on our agenda, but we do have some next meeting proposed agenda items, and I do have a list. <laughs> so I will go over that, and I know a couple of them would be um, Ryan's 
I think it would be, you know, talking about the red light cameras and the traffic, traffic calming measures, uh, the grant that we received. It would be also good for us to, uh, I would like to know more about what we're doing for pedestrians with disabilities. I know that we've done um, some work on the corners as far as ramps, but my guess is you guys are doing more than that. And then um, we had a citizen come to us um, for a couple weeks now about abandoned property and how to, uh, what, what the code looked like on that and how we could help him address the issues that they're having in their neighborhood. So if we can get that. And then the other items I think are probably um, not this group, but I will get them on the record. So we have a firearms and ammunition tax uh, idea that we would like to pursue. Yes. And um, we wanted to relook at the noise ordinance that we have. And then we also had the police matrix study update. So we were going to dive into that. Yep. And then I know that Council Member Schwab wanted to uh, revisit the EMS wait times to get an update on. Oh, and there he is. But we don't have an update. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So those are my items and um, we're just going over next agenda items. I think I got them all. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Let's see, I think the EMS wait times update is something, Chief DeMarco is out, but I think he's back now. It's probably something that could be done next month, if that works. Um, it sounds like you're talking about the ADA transition plan. Um, is that what you guys would call it as well? So do you have like a briefing next month or we can talk about timing if you wanna, or if it's just, you can pump that out and you're not a big deal, put it on the agenda. <laughs> Um, on the, um, uh, like nuisance properties topic, um, we did, as you guys know, and as I have learned more about just change our, um, kind of code enforcement, I guess, procedures at the, just at the start of the year. So, you know, four months ago or so. So I think there's some interest from staff to, um, in probably with this particular case in mind to let that process play out a little bit. Um, so if we can have that on the on the future agenda list, but not like next month, like give it a few months to percolate a little bit. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, I can say that that particular case is active. There's been uh, code enforcement contact and they're following the process, so there's action on that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And you, the police matrix study I know was, was, I had like a sort of summer on the list, which I guess May we're pushing into some, maybe this weekend summer begins, I don't know, but <laughs> we'll keep it on the list at least. I don't know for sure. Um, and actually Council President Stonecipher had, had asked the firearms and ammunition tax that it could go through this committee. Yes. Um, it also feels like budget committee, but then that's kind of everybody at the regular meeting. So, so anyways, it's on the list and I know, um, I know our. I know we have information about it, and there's good examples from what Seattle and Tacoma have done. So, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. she just wanted it to go through here. We're not anticipating a large uh, amount of income off of it, but um, yeah, just want to make it a little more challenging. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's all I have. So you have our agenda items for future. And um, anybody else have anything they want to say, Ben? No. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. And we'll see you next month.